Amen. God bless you and welcome to Calvary Grace. It's our Bible study. And we are in the 12th week dealing with angels and demons. As I've said pretty much in every Bible study so far in this series, the theme of this series comes from a pagan television show. And it is very much a pagan TV show. And everything about it, in my opinion, is wrong, except for the tagline at the opening. And it's one that's ever present in my mind when I study for this series, and I hope will be present in your mind. And here's the tagline. We are not alone. We've never been alone. I always feel like the devil will tell you 99 truths to slip in one lie. In that particular show, I think there's 99 lies and one truth. I believe it is absolutely correct that even from the time of the creation of Adam, we have never been alone on this planet. First of all, God has never left us. and He was even there in the Garden of Eden prior to their sinning. But we also know that the enemy is there. And it's important to recognize that fact. Before I get into tonight, where we're going to deal with demons, take your Bibles and turn to James chapter 4, verse 5. James 4, verse 5. And here's what it says. It says, or do you think, Scripture says, without reason, that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely? But he gives us more grace. That is why Scripture says God opposes the proud. Interesting statement, isn't it? God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That would get you banned from Twitter. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you. Now before we start looking at the demonic side. It is absolutely important. That you understand you can resist him. And he will flee from you. As a matter of fact, he is terrified of what you've got. He is terrified of what's in you. He cannot stand it. In fact, we'll see a little bit more tonight in a bit more depth how afraid he actually is. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Take your Bibles and just jump with me real quickly to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. You'll find that right after 1 Corinthians. And chapter 12 is just after chapter 11. I do believe at least one of you smiled. The rest of you are just miserable. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 1. I must go on boasting, although there's nothing to be gained. I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. By the way, most commentators believe that this man was actually Paul and that for modesty's sake, he is putting it into the third person. Whether it was into the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. This is the man caught up to heaven. He said, I don't know whether he was caught up physically or caught up spiritually. I don't know. Only God knows. I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I don't know. Only God knows, was caught up to paradise. By the way, that in itself is an amazing Bible study. He heard inexpressible things. Things man is not permitted to tell. 
I have to tell you, I've been studying NDEs just recently, near-death experiences. And uh, I'm always very skeptical of these so-called Christians that come back telling all kinds of tales of what they say they saw on the other side. If somebody has died and gone to heaven and come back, I would have to understand and believe that according to the Word of God, they're not permitted to tell what they've seen. And yet what we have here is individuals that have all kinds of varying stories. They don't all line up. They're all very different. And if you're not a Christian, you tend to see what you expect to see. Muslims see Allah and uh, their God. And, uh, you know, the Hindus see various gods. And the people of the South, I South Sea Islands who worship the, the dead uh, see their relatives. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff that people claim to see on the other side. The stories don't line up. I really could go off on that. I'm trying not to. I will be preaching on it in the next few months. I will boast about a man like that. But I'll not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I, I wouldn't be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so that no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I say. To keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing great revelations, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh. Now understand, Paul had revelations that no human being had had. I don't think any other man in the Bible save for the Lord himself, had greater revelation than Paul. You might understand this if you've ever been sick and talked to a doctor. And the doctor, because of his great brilliance, looks down his nose at you like you are some sort of dirt on the ground. I remember my wife, many, many years ago when we were first married, she had a gallbladder attack, and uh, she was vomiting blood, and, and it was a horrible, terrible thing. We went into the hospital, and the surgeon came in, and I said, look, is there anything other than removing the gallbladder? Is there any alternative? And he sneered at me, as though I was such an idiot to ask the question. And here we have Paul saying, listen, because of my great revelation, my great opening of the heavens like nobody else has had, there has been given to me a thorn in the flesh. Why is that important? Well, I don't want you to run around and think you've been given a thorn in the flesh. Unless you can say you've had revelation like Paul, then don't say you've got a thorn in the flesh like Paul. Three times I pleaded with the Lord and it was taken away from me. Uh, to, to, pardon me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, I boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that in Christ, that Christ's power might rest on me. That's why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. What are we seeing here? Well, people argue about this. Some <coughs> believe that this was some, <coughs> excuse me, some kind of demonic possession. If you're going to argue that, then you would have to argue that your Bible at least your New Testament, two-thirds of it, was written by a demoniac. And so I can't see that. I do not believe that Paul was demon-possessed. But I do believe that Paul was oppressed by the enemy. And having said that, 
I believe we are too. There are oppressions that come against us, but they are not possessions. There is a vast difference. If you want to study demon possession, take your Bible at some point on your computer and type in demon possession when you get into one of your Bible programs and look at how the demon possessed people acted. They had superhuman strength. They were violent. They were wicked. There's none of them twisting their heads around. There's nobody vomiting pea soup. All the things that Hollywood presents is not demon possession according to the Bible. But many Christians today believe they're demon possessed. Oh, I've got an issue. I've got a problem. I've got a secret sin. I've got this. I've got that. I've got the other. I, I, I believe I've got a demon. And there are entire ministries who make an, in, well, an entire ministry out of casting demons out of Christians. Now, some Christians act like the devil. Some of them are as mean and nasty as a junkyard dog. But I do not believe they are demon-possessed. However, we can absolutely be oppressed by the enemy. He can be brutal. I will in later weeks go into some of the things he can do, but at this stage, we're just touching on the topic. Paul said, because of the surpassing great revelation, I was given this issue to keep me humble. And he said, I asked the Lord three times to remove it from me. And all God would say was, your grace or my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. Take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Ephesians 6, 10. And here's what it says. A finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stake, take, pardon me, take your stand against the devil's schemes. Notice the plurality here. It's not the devil's scheme, it's schemes. There's a plurality. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We don't fight against people. But against rulers and against authorities and against powers of this dark world and against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done so, or uh, after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the faming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests, and with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the saints. Look at verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities and against powers of this dark world and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Just to take it in reverse order, the American government in 2017 released images of what they call online now and in the news a UAP, the Tic Tac. And uh, this thing has no moving parts, leaves no heat signature, can go from 5,000 miles an hour to zero instantaneously, can go from 70,000 feet 
to zero feet instantaneously. It can do things that defy science. Slowly but surely, more and more information has been dripping out. And they are coming to the conclusion that this is an alien craft. Of course, we don't call them UFO anymore because you're crazy if you've seen a UFO. But if you've seen a UAP, you're all right, even though it's the same thing. Well, bearing that in mind, our Bible tells us of spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. These things are not coming to help mankind. They're evil at their core. I have spoken in the past about the theology that they preach, and they do preach a theology. They actually communicate, and people that have communicated with them talk about the fact that they can't yet reveal themselves because there's too many things standing in the way. They're waiting for a time when Christians will no longer, fundamental Christians will no longer fight against them. It's very clear what we're dealing with. But then it talks about a little bit earlier in the verse here, against powers of this dark world. There are not only demonic realms in the mid heavens above us, but there are powers assigned to this dark world. We have talked about Daniel and the war that went on and how the angel coming to Daniel had to fight his way through the heavens and actually required the help of Michael the Archangel. And that says, going back in the verse again, against authorities and against rulers. That word rulers is very interesting to us in the Greek. I could give you the Greek word, but it's not going to help you. So I'm just going to give you a better English word. Principalities. Principalities. Good old King James. But against principalities and against authorities and powers of this dark world and against spiritual forces of evil. What it's telling us is that the demonic world is well organized. It's not just a bunch of crazy demons released like the wild animals. It is very well organized. And there are princedoms, and they're set up over areas, geographical areas. Take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 12, verse 22. Let me show you this. Matthew 12, 22. It says, Then they bought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him. Now notice that the demon possess possession, in his case, produced blindness and an inability to speak, so that he could both talk and see. And all the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it's only by Beelzebub, now watch the next line, the prince of demons, principalities, princedoms. It's only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. So they're saying, listen, he's got a, he's got a bigger demon than the demon he's driving out, and that's all it is. He's just depending on this larger demon. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Eve, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. And every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then can a kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by the way, notice Jesus never said there's no Beelzebub. 
He said, if I'm using Beelzebub, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, the kingdom of God has come upon you. You are face to face with the kingdom of God. If this is not a bigger demon as you say, and this is actually the Spirit of God, then you are simply face to face with the kingdom of God. Here it is. Principalities. Here is one of the princes as identified by the Jews and agreed to by Jesus. There are princedoms. It is an organized group. The Bible tells us that the enemy, the devil, is the prince of the power of the air. Well organized, well oiled machine. Well, there's something very interesting about the demonic realm. Go to Luke chapter 11, verse 21. It's the same story, incidentally, just picking it up in a different book. Luke eleven twenty one. 21. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when somebody stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up the spoils. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. When an evil spirit comes out of a man, it goes through arid or dry places seeking rest and doesn't find it. And then it says, I'll return to the house I left. And when it arrives, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. And then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go and live there. And the final condition of the man is worse than the first. As Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, Blessed is the woman that gave you birth and nursed you. And Jesus replied, Blessed rather are those that hear the word of God and obey it. I believe, incidentally, that was a demon-possessed woman crying out. And here what we have is Jesus saying, Listen, when somebody is guarding their house, they're safe until somebody bigger attempts to break in with more power. And if that spirit is cast out, it goes through dry and arid places. I take a lot of joy in that because my brother lives in Arizona. I am from New Zealand and above us is Australia a very dry and arid place. Seeking rest and does not find it. Isn't that kind of odd? When he's saying, listen, a demonic spirit that's cast out goes through dry places, arid places, and can't find any peace, can't find a place to inhabit, a place to rest, a place to take shelter. of. And then it says, I'll return to the house I left. And when it arrives and finds the house swept clean and put in order, then it goes and takes seven more spirits or other spirits, more wicked than itself, so it's coming back with reinforcements. And the final condition of the man is worse than the first. And we will deal more with demon possession in future weeks. But what you're seeing here is that when demons are cast out, they go through dry and arid places, according to Jesus. Why would that be a problem? We live in dry and arid places. We live in BC as well, where you rust. There's all kinds of places we live in. We live in cold climates and hot climates. 
and we can suit them to ourselves and we can survive very well, why would it be an issue that these things, when they're cast out, go through dry and arid places? Take your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 3, verse 13. Genesis 3.13. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. So the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above the livestock and all the wild animals, you will crawl on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. Let me tell you, I won't even have a dirt devil in my house. They used to have these vacuum cleaners called dirt devils. I refuse to buy them, even though they do eat dust. But here it's very clear. Part of the curse was dry, dust, arid places. And when these things are cast out, they are reminded of this curse, ultimately reminded of the power of God. You're going to see that in a few moments. Reminded of the torment and and dry and arid is torment. In Psalm 63, verse 1, it says this. O God, you are my God. I earnestly seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you. In a dry and weary land where there's no water, I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because, of your love, or because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify and I will praise you as long as I live. And your name will, I will lift up. My soul will be satisfied with the richest, pardon me, my soul will be satisfied as with the richest foods. My singing lips and mouth will praise you and so on. He's talking about the fact that he's thirsty for the presence of God. You see in the Bible, being thirsty and dry is a picture of being separated from the power and the anointing and the presence of God. And here we have demons that are going through dry and arid places and are tormented. It gets worse for them, by the way. In Psalm 42, we read this. As a deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O my God. My soul thirsts for God as for the living God. Where can I go to meet with my God? In Psalm 63, it says this, O oh my God, you are my God. I earnestly seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there's no water. You see, when Jesus said they're cast out and they find themselves in dry places, arid places, it's a picture of a place of torment. Have you ever been thirsty? I mean, really thirsty. I don't know why, but I can recall once as a child being in a car over, a, say, a 40 mile drive. And for some reason, this stood out as I was just tormented by the thirst. I, 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 I just could hardly stand it. And by the time we got to where we were going, which was out in the country, I tore out of that car and I tore into the house and I grabbed the first glass of water I could and I downed that thing. <sighs> Thirst is a horrible place. It's a tormenting place. And these spirits cannot find peace in the dry and arid land. They seek to be embodied. They seek to be in the body of people. What did Jesus say? In John chapter 7, verse 37, he said this, On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the spirit 
By this he meant the Spirit, Spirit, whom those who believed in him would later receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not yet been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. This connection between the Spirit and dry and thirsty even applies to the Holy Spirit and our state before we come to him. When we come to Jesus, he fills that thirst in our souls. Prior to that, we have a thirst that cannot be quenched. The world tries to quench it, by the way, and many have turned to uh, uh, Satanism and, and the, the occult and the various cults and, and the various organizations. I, I see so many organizations out there doing good things for people to try and quench the longing of the souls of people that are thirsty for God but don't know it. So, let's get them handing out cookies. Let's get them collecting money at Christmas time. Let's get them giving out this and giving out that and working in the community. And all of that is important. All of that is good. Nothing is wrong with that. But it must not replace turning to God and receiving salvation. If you're thirsty, you turn to Christ and you will receive that Spirit of God. You'll see why that's important in a few minutes. Take your Bibles and let's turn to tonight's passage. We're warming up to it. Mark chapter 5, verse 1. And it says, they went across the lake to the region of Gennesaret. And when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs. And no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. So superhuman strength. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but tore the chains apart and broke the irons off his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Now, by the way, we see another passage in the book of Luke, where, uh, pardon me, in the book of Acts, written by Luke, where the men that uh, were casting out demons were trying to cast a demon out of a man in the name of Jesus whom Paul used. And the demon answers back and said, Paul, I've heard about. Uh, Jesus, I know. Paul, I've heard about. You, I don't know who you are. And then the demon rose up in the man and beat up all seven of them and sent them out running out of the house naked and bleeding. The seven sons of Sceva. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons off his feet, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. This is demonic power. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Listen, we live in a generation that cuts themselves. I found that to be very significant. You say, oh, I don't know anyone that cuts, you know anyone with a tattoo? Think about it. And when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. Notice he was submitted to Jesus instantaneously. By the way, isn't it interesting? The people of his generation didn't recognize him. The demoniacs most certainly did, and the demons absolutely did. They knew who he was. Nobody else did. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus? Son of the Most High God. Again, isn't it interesting? He knows who he is. Swear to God that you'll not torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. And then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him, look at this, out of the area. That's significant. 
We could spend a lot of time on the name and the number and so on. But first of all, I want you to see this. Swear to God that you'll not torture me. The devils were afraid that Jesus would torture them. He ultimately will. And, and this demon was afraid to come out because of the punishment that he thought he might receive at the hands of Jesus. I tell you what, you have a most powerful name he has given you to use. You are able to command the enemy in the name of Jesus. For Jesus, uh, for Jesus had said to him, come out, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? He said, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of the area. He was, these demons were located in this area and they wanted to remain in that area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the hillside nearby. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs and allow us to go into them. It's almost merciful of what Jesus is doing. Instead of just casting them out and driving them out of that area, they go into the pigs. Now you have to, first of all, ask yourself, why are there pigs in Israel? That in itself is crazy. They're forbidden to eat pork. And here we are in a Jewish area in Israel, and they're herding pigs. Apparently there was a few on the side that enjoyed the bacon burger. And he gave them permission. And the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. And the herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake where they were drowned. Notice, they went straight away into the water. Dry and arid places, water. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this to the town and the countryside and the people went out to see what was happening. And when they came to Jesus, they saw the man that had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind uh, and were afraid. And those that had seen it told the people what had happened and, and that the, uh, and, pardon me, to the, happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. And the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. Apparently, they wanted bacon more than they wanted Jesus. It's rather interesting. You'd think they might have said, wow, praise God, Shimon is healed. Demons are out of him. He's back in his right mind. But no. They said, uh, oh, we can't have that. There's more pigs over there. What if he does that to the next herd? You know, uh, <laughs> You better take your religion and, and get out of Dodge. As Jesus was getting into the boat, who had been, uh, uh, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. And Jesus didn't let him. He said, go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis, that's the ten cities, how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. To me, it's fascinating that these demons not only rushed into the pigs, but then they rushed the pigs into the water. They were that afraid of the dry and arid places, even though it meant that they were going to be without flesh, They rushed them into the water. Now this does tell us a couple of things. First of all, animals could be demon-possessed. No, I don't believe your black cat is demon-possessed. But animals can be possessed by spirits, whether we like it or not. Secondly, 
They want desperately to avoid dry and arid places. The curse that God places on them is that you'll run on your belly. Now we know the serpent comes into the garden on legs. He comes in as a dragon. We know that from Revelation. It's very clear. He comes in as a dragon. He's beautiful. He's fire-breathing. He's amazing. He speaks. He impresses them. And he may have been going into that garden many times before the time that he actually turns to Eve and says, try this, God just doesn't want you to know good from evil. He doesn't want you to be like him. He's trying to ruin your fun. But one day he does come up with that. And the fall starts. Dry and arid places. Take your Bibles and turn to Revelation 20. And let's see if we can see a hint as to why they want to avoid dry and arid places. Revelation 20, verse 7. When the thousand years is over, and yes, I believe that's a literal figure, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out and deceive the nations, the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them to battle. In number, they're like the sand of the seashore. They march across the breadth of the earth, surrounded by the, uh, surrounding the camp of God's people, the city he loves. By the way, Notice that they're organized. They march across the breadth. Fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur with the beast and the false prophet that were thrown there. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. There is the ultimate dry and arid place in which these spirits will be tormented. They are cast into hell. Their whole beings crave moisture, but they will ultimately be cast into the most dry and arid place that has ever existed. It will be tormenting to them day and night for the rest of eternity. You believe in one God? Good. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. Here's James, chapter 2, verse 19. He's talking about the Shema. You believe in one God? Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one God? Well, good for you. But the demons believe that too, and they shudder. Why would they shudder just knowing that God exists and that he's one? Because ultimately they know there's a time, there's an end, there's a place where they are going to be tormented from then on. They might have free reign right now under Lucifer himself. And Beelzebub is one of the princes. But there comes a time when they will be rounded up and they will be cast into hell. Now, before we go any further, turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit, of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. I've thought so much about this. I'm well aware of the word seal as it applies to a, an envelope. Remember, we used to get Easter seals. And you would get Christmas seals that would go on your envelopes for your Christmas cards. 
We even have a seal for the church, which we put on any legal document. Seal. But there is another use for the word seal. And if you own any Tupperware, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It means that what's inside is sealed in. Now listen. And don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. God has sealed you closed and put his spirit inside you as that seal. Turn back a couple of chapters. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. Why am I making this point? Because there's so many believers that think that everything is a demon. Oh, my sore foot's a demon. No, your sore foot it's because you ate too much rich food and you've got gout. Stop eating the rich food, the gout goes away, and you don't chase demons off by changing your diet. Oh, I've become ill, I've got a demon. No, no, if you can treat it with an antibiotic, it's not a demon. We can go on and on and on. Things that people think are demons. Do you have superhuman strength? Are you able to read the minds of other people? Let's look at what the Bible actually teaches concerning this before we start running around telling Christians they've got demons. Non-Christians have demons. They live in a demonic world. They are many absolutely controlled by demons. Not every person is controlled by a demon. But the people that would have a demon are unbelievers, not believers. You've been sealed. Now listen. You're in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you are marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. Not the devil's possession. I belong to God. You belong to God. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you belong to him. You're his possession. What do you think? He's going to share space? Is this some sort of cohabiting situation where you've got God on this side and the devil on that side? God in this hand, the devil on that side? No. Absolutely not. You belong to God. You are possessed by him. You are owned by him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, you can turn there. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. Here again. For no, no matter how many promises he's made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now it is God that makes both us and you to stand firm in Christ. He anointed us. Set his seal of ownership on us. And put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Again, we're being told we are owned, we are possessed, we are his possession. A lot of ministries run around making a lot of claims about demon possession. And Christians who just want to be more like Jesus, who want to do better and live better and have less faults and failings, get feeling like, well, maybe I've got a demon. Maybe this is a demon. And so they begin to try and cast demons out of believers. Listen, own your bad behavior. Stop the nonsense. Stop trying to blame it off on some other spirit. You are owned by God. You are his possession. And you need to own any bad behavior you have. Deal with it. Get right with God and carry on. In John, or 1 John chapter 4, we read this. 
1 John chapter 4. Dear friends, don't believe in every spirit, but test the spirits and see whether they're from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. By the way, John is writing here against Gnosticism. The Gnostics believed that Jesus was ethereal, that when he walked, he never left footprints and so on. It's a long story. You can search it out for yourself at some point. It's crazy. And he was writing against this in the book of 1 John. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist or Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and is even now already in the world. You, dear friends, are from God and have overcome them. Let's just stop right there. You are not overcome by them. You have overcome them. Because the one that is in you is greater than the one that's in the world. Now we need to just soak in that. I have talked to people that believe that Christians can be demon-possessed, and it's amazing. You can read this to them right out of the text, and they glass over like it doesn't exist. Yes, but I know somebody. And every time I'm with them, their eyes glow red. Oh, come on. Wear sunglasses. Stop the nonsense. I, I just hear so much crazy talk from Christians. If they're unbelievers, they're open season. If they don't know Jesus, they don't know Jesus. They don't have the protection. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers and authorities in this dark world and in heavenly, uh, in, in heavenly realms and so on. And then it goes on and it describes for us the armor that we're to put on. So it must offer us protection. And we are told that the Spirit of God seals us. And somebody said to me, well, hold it. <laughs> you think you're smart? What if you have a demon and you get saved? I think what they were expecting me to say was, oh, that's a problem. Wow, I, I guess if you get saved and you got a demon, he's trapped inside. Mm -hmm. He's sealed in too. No. If you have a demon and you get saved, that demon is going to run all the way to hell. He's going to go back to the area he came from. He is not going to be comfortable in you anymore. Nothing about you is going to please him, and he is not going to want to be in you. He is going to jump out like a fish swimming upstream. No. You, dear children, you are from God and have overcome them, these demonic entities, because the one that is in you is greater than the one that's in the world. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 23, it says this. This is the command, or this is his command, to believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he has loved us. Those who obey his commands live in him, and he in them. Those who obey his commands live in him, and he in them. Again, it's not going to be God in the top floor and the devil in the bottom floor. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. You see, it's, it's very clear from the scriptures. You are either saved or unsaved. If you're saved and you've got bad behavior, you need to deal with it. Oh, well, I'll just go and have the demon cast out. Well, I've seen this. Believe me, I grew up in this ministry. I'm not an early or late comer. I remember the time when ministers were casting demons out of everybody. If you had salt with your meal, that was a demon of salt. 
If you had pepper with your meal, that was a demon of pepper. And they would literally be casting people, uh, demons out of people. Now, here's what happened. People would come to church. And you know how you get a tithe envelope when you come in? Okay. They would hand out vomit bags. You ever noticed how when somebody yawns, Oh, it's just hard sometimes not to yawn. Well, guess what? When somebody vomits, it's hard not to feel sick yourself. They would hand out vomit bags at the door. People would come in and they would sit, and then at a certain point, they'd have an altar call, and they would come down, and, and the man of God would stand there, and he would tell the demons to come out of these people, and they'd start vomiting. And once one vomited, believe me, everybody was in for the party. Everything was a demon. And even as a child, I stepped back and said, this is crazy making. Something's wrong here. Now, I didn't have the theology to understand what was wrong. But I knew it wasn't right. And these people would go from church to church to church, Vomit bags in hand. It's silly. It's absolutely silly. And then they would spend hours driving a demon out of somebody, who, by the way, never had one. Come out, I won't come out. Come out, I won't come out. Come out, I won't come out. What's your name, Bob? Give me a break. It was just crazy. Jesus never wrestled with the demons in this fashion. He was very clear. Come out. They came out. Now again, if you're dealing with the occult, if you're dealing with the cults, you most certainly are dealing with demons. But if you're dealing with born-again believers that love and serve Jesus Christ and are genuinely born again, you are not dealing with demons, you're dealing with bad behavior. And people love to shovel off their behavior onto a demon. I'm not a thief. It was the devil that made me do it. Remember Geraldine? Yes. Flip Wilson. The devil made me do it. I have seen so much of that nonsense. People laughed at that because it was a comedy routine. But the truth is, that's actually what many Christians today believe. Well, in Romans chapter 8, verse 10, it says this. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead to sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit that raised Christ from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it's not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if we live according to the sinful nature, you'll die. But if by the spirit you put to, deed, to death the, de the misdeeds of the body, you'll live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. Listen to that carefully. You did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave to fear. How could you be demon possessed? The Bible says you didn't receive that spirit. but you receive the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And now if we're children, or if we're children then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may share in his glory. Passage after passage after passage telling you you're sealed. You're owned. You are possessed. 
You are occupado, if you want it in Spanish. You're occupied. There's a spirit inside you. It's not a demon. It's the spirit of God. And by the way, if you don't have his spirit, you're not saved. It's that simple. Does that mean that all Christians are good people doing good things all the good time? No. But it does mean that Christians are responsible for their own behavior. Amen. And that we did not receive a spirit of the world yes. or a spirit that makes us a slave again to fear. Right. We received the spirit of sonship. Mm -hmm. We are family with God and with Jesus Christ. Amen. Will you bow your heads? Precious Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that this has been a blessing to your people, both in the building here and online. May they be lifted and encouraged and strengthened, Father, as we deal with this or begin to deal with this most difficult topic. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.